Any questions on what we have done up until now on the dual simplex thingy? Let me repeat myself. Uh, simplex algorithm, the thing that we saw said up until now simplex is actually primal simplex because it maintains primal feasibility. Now we also learned another simplex algorithm. It's again simplex because it determines living and entering variables, makes a ratio test and maintains one of the feasibilities all the time and maintains complementary slackness all the time. Primal simplex maintains primal feasibility. Dual simplex maintains dual feasibility. Primal simplex stops. Well, both of these algorithms maintains complementary slackness. Primal simplex stops when the dual becomes feasible, which is our row zero non-negative. Dual simplex stops when primal becomes feasible, which is right-hand side non-negative. Okay, that's all. Now let's look at this problem. We have, I have one more example for dual simplex, and then I'll go to sensitivity analysis if there are not any questions. Now let's look at this example here. It says maximizing minus 2x1 minus 3x2 minus 4x2. I have two greater than or equal to type constraints. Now, be careful the format, okay? This format immediately triggers dual simplex algorithm. Maximize negative row zero coefficients, well, objective function coefficients and non-negativity in the constraints. Look at the primal problem. I'm supposed to add two variables I usually, well, I have to subtract excess variables, but if I, I, I told you it's okay to have a negative right-hand side, so I multiply each constraint with minus one. Now I have a starting BFS, but negative right-hand side. It's okay because my dual, my simplex table would believe that it is optimal because dual feasible. All right. Uh, let's in the meantime look at the dual problem. My dual problem is minimizing minus, with respect to minuses, minus 3w1 minus 4w2 subject to these constraints. Okay, this is canonical form. No, this is canonical form. This is the uh, version of it. Okay. Table. This was our primal, right? Let's look at the table then. This is my table. My dual row zero is non-negative, but my right-hand side is not. Yeah, I have to. I have to find a living variable. I'm gonna select most negative. Be careful, by the way. The dual is here, underneath the starting BFS, and so my dual solution is zero zero. Put zero zero here. Dual is feasible. Yeah, zero greater than minus two, greater than minus three, greater than minus four. Objective function is zero. Yes, objective function is zero. So corollary two works. No, corollary, well, it's not, uh, corollary one says they're optimal and they're optimal, but the objective function values are equal. Complementary slackness satisfied. Dual feasible, primal not. All right, let's apply the dual simplex algorithm. It says choose the most negative entry, kick the guy out of the basis. This variable is x5. I don't want x5 in my basis anymore. So I have to find out who should enter so that x5 lives and my row zero remains non-negative, okay? Then uh, you do the ratio test. What is the ratio set? Row zero coefficient divided by the entry in the absolute value. So only the negative ones are valid. These are not valid. This one gives you two over two, which is one. This one gives you four over three. Smallest ratio wins. That means x1 is gonna enter, x5 is gonna leave, yeah? The next iteration here is x4. You do the ratio test. I mean, you do the iterations. This was the previous case. This is the next iteration. And now I have x1 in here, x4 in there. I do have my appropriate identity. I have rest. Be careful. My row zero, my row zero is still non-negative. I still have an entry in here that I don't like. All right. And from the duals perspective, it's becoming, now my new dual variables are zero, one, and the dual's objective is decreasing. Okay, this one is gonna leave. This is the only negative entry. I look at my ratios. This is invalid. Well, I only, this is invalid. This is invalid. This is invalid. I'll only check these guys. 
4 over 5 over 2, 1 over 1 over 2. This is the smallest one, so x2 enters. As you see, the next iteration, we're done. Primal feasible, dual feasible. Complementary cyclic is always there anyway. So optimal. We're done. Uh, this is the dual vector. Somebody asking a question? Uh, yes, I wanted to ask something. Yes. Uh, why did we cross out X3 as not appropriate? We cannot consider it. Why can't Because we? it's it's coefficient in the ratio test is not negative. Only the ones for which B inverse A's J entry is negative are valid. Let me bring back you the algorithm statement. Here it is. You only look at where yij is strictly less than zero. In this example here, the yij for x3, y43 is positive. So it's invalid. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Ajam, can I ask something? Sure, sure, Dennis. Uh, in the initial uh, table, um, like our problem, our maximization problem actually had negative coefficients. Can we mm -hmm. just turn them into positive by multiplying them with minus one and the problem wouldn't change? The problem becomes a minimization problem then. No? Yeah, Why are you multiplying the row of zero coefficients with minus one? Uh, yeah, but we did uh, use positive coefficients when we had negative. I didn't understand that. But, but that's z minus cx equals zero. Rho of zero oh, okay, is z okay, minus yeah, okay, cx. Sorry. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, okay, thank okay. you. Any other questions? All right, let's look at this summary table. I like it a lot. This is our good old simplex, and this is the dual version, all right? Good old simplex, what does it do? Uh, hold on. Always primal feasible because the normal simplex says right hand side should remain non negative. That was the motivation in the ratio test in the simplex algorithm. Okay? And stops when dual feasibility is reached because stops when drop zero becomes non negative. Otherwise, it looks for a negative entry in there. So it looks for a dual variable, which is which a dual constraint, which is violated. And then that variable corresponding to that constraint should be entry. That's what it says, right? Then the ratio test is looking this in the positive entries of the right-hand side divided by the, the entry by IJ. This was our simplex. Dual simplex, always dual feasible. Row zero coefficients are always non-negative. If primal feasibility is reached, we stopped. We stop. Primal feasibility is reached. Else, that means there is a negative entry in the right hand side. So I have to enter that, I have to kick that variable out of the basis. So that's my living variable. An entering variable is determined by the ratio test of this. Be careful, dual simplex works with the negative yij, whereas primal simplex works with the positive yij. Neither of them use the zeros because they're not active, all right? One of them, primal, only looks at the values for which yij is positive, whereas dual simplex looks at the cases where yij is strictly negative, all right? Dual simplex maintains dual feasibility. Primal simplex maintains primal feasibility. Any questions? Anything that you want to add, ask, whatever. Any questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, sensitive to analysis then, all right? Let's start sensitive to analysis because we do need our slots anyway. Okay. I promised you that uh, the, the main motivation of today's lecture was actually react to changes in life's parameter. How would we react? How would we utilize uh, the information that we already know in determining our next solution when 
a tiny little change happens in my parameters. So, so SWIT analysis, let's read it together, is concerned with how changes in LP's parameters affect the LP's optimal solution. What are my parameters? Let's look at this problem again, subject to, let's say, AX equals B, X not negative. Yeah, let's look at the equality case. My parameters are C. C, A, and B. My parameters are my objective function coefficients, my consumption parameters, A's. This is actually a matrix of AI Jane's. The J, uh, the I parameters requirement, I constraint requirement for the variable J. And I have my uh, resources vector, B. Yeah? Okay, what happens if one of these things change? Like I have a huge A matrix and all of a sudden I remember, I realized that we made a tiny little mistake in one of those entries. Should we solve everything from scratch? Or should we utilize what we have done mistakenly and put the mistake in and react based on that? This is sensitive analysis, okay? Some other parameters, like the market prices may fluctuate. Production may be affected due to some accidental event or machine breakdowns. Some supply of raw materials may not come. Finished products may change. Demand may change. So in reaction to change in parameters, or there is always solving from scratch, of course. You put the new parameters in, solve it, whatever method you're using, and get the solution. Fine. This is always a valid thingy that you could do. But what else? Well, let's, we're industrial engineers, yeah? So let's utilize what we already know. Let's try to be as efficient as possible. So let's, similar problems usually will have similar solutions. So let's uh, try to recatch the real optimal with the new data by using the previous solution. That is sensitivity analysis. How sensitive is my solution to my problem parameters, actually? That's how it comes up. All right, then. So uh, this is, I've written this for canonical form version. So my parameters are my B, my right-hand side can change. My C, objective function coefficients can change. I may have a change in AIJ or the whole column. Like say, I'm producing a product and all of a sudden the consumption uh, parameters of that product may change. Well, I may think of adding a new product to my line or there, may be, there must be something, there may be something I forgot and there's another constraint that I have to satisfy. These are the things that can happen and we will utilize everything we learned up until now uh, to react to these kinds of changes. Are we clear? Do you have any questions? Okay. Um, let's remember this. This is a very important slide, actually. This was my primal. And this is the corresponding dual, right? The dual of the... Uh, Simplex algorithm the pro of this primal. They, they, I told you they are coming with pairs. Now, this is the table with respect to a given B. What did I told, tell you like 10 minutes ago? The problem is primal feasible if right-hand side is non-negative. The problem is dual feasible if row zero is non-negative. I keep telling you simplex table always satisfies complementary slackness. So... These are going to be optimal if both are feasible. So this is all we. This is the only tool we have, whose feasibility is lost, so that we try to recover it. This is the idea under sensitivity analysis. So we're going to look at the table and see what part of the table is changed. All right. Always remember. Let's let me write this table here because it's very handy. So I'm going to, oopsie, I will have B inverse A, all right? 
minus C plus C B B inverse A. B inverse B, C B B inverse B. For any B, this is my table. Yeah? Now for, for the change that happened, whatever the change is, so it could be in C, A, or B. Depending on which part of my table is changed, I'll continue with the appropriate simplex algorithm. That is the strategy then. See what part of the table is affected. Then revise that part with respect to new data and see what happens. If primal feasible but dual feasibility is lost, use the standard simplex algorithm. If dual is feasible, primal became infeasible, we know not to do right now, apply dual simplex. If both are, jug are gone, if you are no longer primal and dual feasible, that means you're in trouble, go back, start from scratch. You cannot fix it. You have to maintain one of these guys, non-negative, so that you utilize one of the algorithms. Okay. I think I'll stop here, but I want you to be very confident with this one. This is this, this, the matrix notation thingy. If you have questions about this, we still like half, a, half an hour left, so you can remain and I can explain. Or, uh, but I want you to really be very confident with this, with the table and the duality theorems, because those are the tools that we will be using. And while you guys will have a quiz anyway, so this is the, the material anyway, uh, I will utilize these informations in uh, developing the sensitivity analysis based on different parameters, but I don't want to start that right now. So if you have any questions, I can repeat anything. Otherwise, uh, I'll call it a day today. Any questions, I'm here. I can re-explain anything or even from the Dalton theorems or simplex algorithm, whatever. Anything that you want me to go over, I can. If not, I'm stopping. Hujam duality. Yeah, what part of duality? All of it? Some theorems? Theorems. Okay. Strong duality theorem. Uh, do I have it here? Is this duality theorems? No, this is duality theorems. This one, right? Strong. Let, let me let me go over all those theorems, uh, what they are in a nutshell. Yeah? I keep saying duality theorems, duality theorems, but they're no big deal. There are only three theorems. Weak duality, strong duality, complementary selections. What is weak duality? Weak duality says, let me go all the way through. Weak duality, even though it says weak, it's one of the strongest things coming out. What does it say? Take... Be careful, first of all, primal and dual, they're always coming in pairs, right? For a primal problem, there is a, there, exi there exists one dual problem. They're coming in pairs. Okay, take this primal dual pair. We talk the theorem says, the one that you're minimizing, which one I don't know, and the one you're maximizing. Pick any feasible solution for the one that you're minimizing and pick any feasible solution for the one that you're maximizing. The theorem says, the one that you're minimizing will always be an upper bound for the one that you're maximizing, okay? And its corollary says, when they're equal, so pick a feasible solution from here, pick a feasible, from, feasible solution from the other problem. If their objective function values are equal, then they have to be optimal. This is the corollary one. Corollary two says, okay, this is I'm minimizing, this is the one I'm maximizing. These are primal dual pairs. I don't know which one is primal, which one is dual. Corollary two says, if one goes all the way up or down, if one of these problems are unbounded, that means there is no bound in the other case. That means there is no feasible solution in here that is a bound for this guy. So corollary two says, if one of these problems is unbounded, the other one has to be infeasible, okay? These two corollaries coming from the fact that the one that you're minimizing is always an upper bound for the one that you're maximizing. Big delta theory. Then we have seen strong duality. What was strong duality doing? It says, it's an interesting theorem. It says, 
Okay, again, for a primal dual pair. Okay, if one of these problems has an optimal solution, so does the other one. That's all it says. Okay, if one of them has an optimal solution, so does the other one. All right, it also utilizes during the proof that this dual solution we're talking about can be deducted from the simplex table because it's CBB inverse. If B is my optimal basis, then CBB inverse is actually the optimal dual solution corresponding to this primal optimal solution. This is what strong duality says. Do you, do you want me to go over the proof also? Or is, Didam, is your question regarding the meaning of it? Or do you want me to go over the proof also? Yoko Jam, proof again. Okay. All right then. So that was strong duality theory. Weak duality is strong duality. Check, right? We understood. Be careful though with the statements. Weak duality is valid. It says if they have feasible solutions, then they're going to be bound to each other. All right? And strong duality says if one of these problems is optimal, then. So when applying these theorems, you always have to remember the if statement, okay? They're only valid when the if statement is valid. So you can only use these conditions when the if is valid. That is very much one of the, the issues in the complementary slackness because the complementary slackness is an if and only if type statement. One of the strongest, well, well one of the handy proof theorems actually because giving the solution of one, we can immediately find the solution of the other. What was it saying? It's saying that, okay, take a primal dual pair. Rana, let me finish complementary slackness, then ask your questions verbally, okay, Rana? Complementary slackness says, okay, take any feasible pairs. Take any feasible pairs. These guys are optimal if and only if they satisfy complementary slackness conditions, all right? That is the issue in the complementary slackness condition. Uh, Rana, what is your question? I don't get it from here. You, I can hear you now, so you can ask it. Uh, Ujjam, when we have a uh, greater than or equal to constraints. Where? In the primal? Yes, in yeah. the primal. Okay. And so uh, we should turn it into a big, big M format. Is, is it necessary to solve it? What, whatever, what, what, hold on, be careful. First of all, what do you want to do? If you want to apply simplex algorithm, if you want to apply a primal simplex algorithm, and if you don't have a slack there, in order to start your simplex algorithm, you need a variable representing that constraint anyway, right? But now you guys learn dual simplex. So if all your constraints are like that, or if one of them is like that, but your dual is feasible, you can use dual simplex. I don't, I don't think I got the question correct. Um, for example, uh, in the, we said an example, Winston P equals 85. Which one? Is it in the, the sensitivity notes or duality notes? No, 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 duality notes. So in this notes then? Yes. The one that I'm going over? Which page? Uh... I don't see the page number, but. Ben nerede hocam biraz? Ben nerede mi? Geçtim mi? Yes, uh, after strong duality theorem. Mm -hmm. ah, right after strong duality. Okay, okay, this one. Yep, this one. Yes, hocam. Yeah. What do you want, Mitch? Okay, what are you asking, Rana? Let's go over again. So, uh, should we necessarily turn it into the big M format in here? This one is trying to tell you that the dual solution is CBB inverse, okay? Now, uh, in the optimal solution. So, and mm -hmm. this also tells you that CBB inverse, well, here, this is my thingy, right? So for certain columns, CBB inverse will be there when the A multiplying that is just one, all right? Right? So this example mm -hmm. is actually trying to teach you that you don't need to find the B and get the inverse and multiply it with CB. 
in order to find the dual solution. The dual solution is always hidden in the simplex table. Oh. But in order, to, in order to find it, where is it? It is underneath the starting BFS. Starting BFS. So this starting BFS, there is no entering. In order to start this algorithm, the simplex algorithm, you need an artificial in here, artificial in there. If you delete the artificial columns when you're done with them, then you won't be able to find their values in the optimal do primal solution. Okay, I don't mind. Get the thanks. You're welcome. Any other questions? May I ask something? Sure. Uh, sure. Say, uh, if we hadn't had an equality, then uh, we wouldn't necessarily need the began formulation, right? Because uh, all we need to do is that add a stack variables to the uh, constraints with less or equal to, and uh, Excess variables will be added to those greater to equal to, and at the end we will just have to multiply my with minus one. The yeah. uh, not necessary. No, no, Ida, no. I don't want you to continue because what you're saying is not correct. Now that is only correct if your table would lead to uh, non-negative row zero with an identity in here. Okay. Now, if you don't put anything to, to this constraint, you will not have an identity like this, first of all. You need this column still. Uh, and you need row zero non-negative. Put this, your row zero is not non-negative. So you can only multiply with, so I only allow negative in here if row zero is non-negative. In the simplex state, negatives in here, negatives in there. No. The main system says the main system says should ifade demiş şey. Yani burada hani yapmamız gereken şey yani sıkıntı eşitlikten dolayı oluyor diye düşünüyorum. No, no, no. Hocam, şu hani şey 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 Stack variable gibi duracak. Yani o stack yapmamız gereken işlemleri sonunda onları eksi birle çarpmak değil mi? That, that's what I keep saying. Okay, hocam. Okay, only, if, only if row zero is non-negative. Okay, hocam. Thanks. When you put this problem to the... So what you can do is take the problem, immediately construct the simplex table, whatever the problem is. All right? Immediately. Then if you see that row zero is non-negative, Then you are allowed to multiply with minus one in the right hand side because okay. you can use dual simplex. Okay. Otherwise, no. And be careful here, you don't have zero, zero, one. You need that one too. So for here, you would definitely need the third arti the artificial anyway for the equality. But again, so that's what you're saying. But again, uh, because row zero is non negative, you won't be able to find, use the E2 as the citing BFS. You won't be ha able to have a minus five in there because you also have minuses in the rows here. Okay. Any other questions? Hocam, dual simplex ile ilgili bir şey soracağım ben ama kaçırdım galiba orayı. Okay, let me open it. Sensitive analysis. Yes, sor. Hocam, bu ikinci yaptığımız örnekte e, neden ilk eksiyle çarptık constraintleri? Ben o kısmı tam anlamadım. How to have a starting BFS? To have, you, I need identity. Yeah? Identity elde etmek için. Ha. Uh, uh, because these are minuses. These were minuses. Yes? Hold on. When I construct this to the table immediately, right? This is what I'm going to see. Z minus. So this is X1, X2, X3, X4, X5, and right-hand side. Z minus. So I'm going to have two. Three, four, zero, zero. Row zero is zero. One, two, two minus one, one, three, zero minus one, minus one, zero, three, four. This is what I have in my hand. Yeah? Then I observe, oh, this is nice. Row zero is not negative. I don't have identity, but if I am allowed to do minuses, then I will have. 
identity. I need identity. That's all I did. That's Anladım. why we did. Tamamdır hocam. Ya? Hocam bir de ilk ya. örnekte e, maximization'ı çevirdik. O her zaman maximization mi olması lazım problemin? No, no. As long as row zero is not negative. Yeah, row zero non negative is for maximization by the way. If your original problem is minimization, you have to be careful in the optimality condition because the minimization's dual is different. So yeah, I suggest you go with max. It, it, so that you all, you, you, you memorize only one rule. Yani çevirsek daha mantıklı yani her seferinde maximization. And, and, so that you would always remember non-negativity for row zero. Which is dual feasibility. As Anladım. long as your problem is minimization, then you then your row zero, in that case, if you carry it like minimization, you want everybody to be negative because for minimization, dual is a max and max standard constraints are greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, so that you would require the other way around. You have to be careful in checking the dual feasibility. Anladım hocam. Okay. Teşekkür ederim. You're welcome. Any other questions? Hocam da ben bir şey sorabilir miyim metric notation'la ilgili? Tabii. Hocam şimdi select variable'ların altına CB, B inverse demiştik. Onların altına da B inverse demiştik ya. Eğer hani access variable'ımız varsa mesela bir tane eksiyle çarpıp şey yapabilir miyiz? Beam versus you have kalın. to be enough. This is, this is what you know, right? Beam versus A. At any uh-huh. iteration. So if this A was a unit vector, right? At the very beginning, then it uh-huh. will give you the B inverse of the current thick B. So if your uh-huh. A was minus one, zero, zero at the very beginning, its column will give you the minus of the corresponding column right now. But you have to be very careful. Don't memorize anything. Just believe that this is being inverse and work with that. Even if you had an excess, you couldn't start your simplex with that anyway. If there was an excess, like in here, right? you, you needed to add an artificial to this guy anyway. So either the artificial's column itself or the negative of the excess column would work, yes. But just be careful. Because it's because B inverse. Tamam. All right. Teşekkür ederim. You're welcome. Any other questions? Okay, I'm stopping the recording. <gülüyor>